every year he took on more and more responsibility in his career. As a matter of fact, his firm really was earmarking him as the one to watch. He was the rising star. He was having a great life. He lived in a gorgeous house, he had great friends, he was partying, he loved his job. And then, the economy tanked. And that, he was pretty lucky. He didn't actually lose his job right away. He made it through the first couple of rounds of layoffs, but eventually, he lost his job. And because he'd been partying and having such a good time, well, he hadn't really saved any money. So the bills start to pile up. Pretty soon, Matt didn't even want to answer his phone because of all the collection calls. And that was pretty tough. He got stressed. He got really depressed. And eventually, he realized that his health was really taking, he was really taking a toll on his health. And there was nothing that he could do about it. Just like a slow motion train wreck. And then, a couple months go by, first of the month happens. And Matt realizes that he doesn't have enough money to pay rent. And he loses his gorgeous house. He loses his home. So he thinks about going to Minnesota and staying with his family, but his mom, unfortunately, suffers from Alzheimer's disease. And so her care prevents him from being in the house. So he did the next best thing. Matt sofa served with friends. And this worked out okay for a while. It wasn't, wasn't too bad. But eventually, his friends got tired of it. He got tired of it. And he didn't have a place to stay. And then one night, he found himself sleeping in his car with only a sleeping bag to keep himself warm. And at about 2.30 or so in the morning, he's freezing cold and he's worrying and he can't actually get the rest that he knows he needs. It kind of dawns on him that he's, he's homeless. He doesn't really know how to handle that. That is the norm when it comes to the shelterless. 90% of all homeless individuals have a story to tell that's similar to Matt's. The chronically homeless, well, they're the folks that we might have a stereotype associated with. You know, we see them panhandling, or they might be sleeping in a doorway of a local business. They make up only 10%. That's pretty crazy. I want you to think a little bit about Matt now and try to imagine what he's like. Think about who his friends are and what that gorgeous house was like. Maybe even what community he lived in. That story is not unique, and it's certainly not unusual or unique to an urban city. About 10 years ago, my mom co-founded a small suburban um, food bank in Oregon. And I have to say, even though I worked in the nonprofit as a head nonprofit career for a long time in San Francisco, I never stopped to think about the real challenges and the impact that poverty had on our suburban neighbors. In fact, much of poverty in the suburbs is completely hidden from our view. We just don't see it. But the majority of, of the poor in America live in the suburbs, not in our urban areas. This could be because of a change in income, like what happened to Matt, but it could also be a change of location, such as when someone is displaced from their home because of the change in property values. Or it could be an increase in crime or density, which forces someone out of their neighborhood that they've known all their life. In San Francisco, in the Bay Area, we've seen a massive decentralization of employment. And that's causing people to move from community to community to community. But most disturbingly, by 19, I'm sorry, by 2005, there was not one single municipality in America where an individual could afford to work a part or full-time minimum wage job and also afford to rent a one-bedroom apartment. Imagine that. The already poor and marginalized neighbors, our friends, our community members, well, they got hit really, really hard in the economic downturn. And they have not been able to recover. They're still working part-time 
or full-time minimum wage jobs. They're, but now they're paying more for their rent and more for their food. And all the while, their benefits are being cut and their hours are being reduced. In Danco, poverty rates increased by 68%, 65% in Pacifica, and that's according to the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, who tracks poverty and the poor in our communities. Think about what this is doing to our Bay Area, the place that we love, that we call home. So, does this make us healthy? Is it healthy to have our kids' school friends sleeping in the cars in the Target parking lot? Are you likely to go shopping when you have to step over someone who's resting in the doorway of a local business? It's pretty unlikely. Well, most people seek refuge from homelessness. And Matt, he did the same. He came to an adult emergency shelter. And when he got there, he was terrified. I think that's the nice way to put it. But he was also humbled by the experience. I mean, think about it. He went from being mentored by the CEO of his firm to sharing a bedroom with 99 other homeless men and women. This had to have a pretty big impact on him. So he's, he was really motivated to take advantage of all of the programs and all the things that he could do to get his life back on track that the nonprofit who ran the shelter could offer him. He took classes to rebuild his credit, which I'm not gonna lie, it was in the toilet. He figured out ways to rebuild the relationships of the people that he had damaged and those relationships that he had damaged. He looked at ways that he could convey his story to a potential landlord so that they might understand what it's like to hire or to rent to someone who has bad credit and a bad rental history. He got a job, he saved money, he began to heal and to try to get healthy again for himself. Because Matt took the time to heal and to get healthy, he, he got healthy thinking about his financial health, his spiritual health, his physical and his emotional health. Well, he was able to get things back on track and really get his life moving in the right direction. But what about those people who aren't so lucky as Matt, who maybe have a chronic health condition, Perhaps they have unstable housing or unstable health care. Well, people who have health problems are more likely to file for bankruptcy. And when you file for bankruptcy, you're more likely to then lose your housing. People who are homeless are at risk for extremely serious health problems. I mean, think about it. Would this, would this be enough to keep you healthy on a cold winter night? So now that you're now that you're sick, we'll assume we're all sick now. Now that you're ill, how do you get treatment? Sometimes you can go to the emergency room and get treatment, but other times, other times you just hope for the best. You hope that you'll find clean water to care for a wound that you might have. You hope that the prescription medicine medicine that you that requires refrigeration will be okay and still, still do its job if it doesn't have cold. Hope. That's what homelessness is all about. It's the hope. The HIV and AIDS community has long supported housing for people with HIV through the federal program Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS. And they have learned that when you provide housing, you have decreased infection rates and increased health outcomes. So we know, we know that homelessness is both a cause and an effect of serious health problems. But we also know that housing can be an answer. That is pretty exciting. So how do we keep ourselves and our communities healthy one solution is to provide affordable housing, and that affordable housing would come to people who maybe made some bad choices in their life, maybe they've had some bad luck, or maybe they're just economically marginalized. So let's think about that again. 
What's going to happen to him when he's ready to leave the shelter? He's been saving money, but he's not certain that he'll be able to sustain renting in an economy like the Bay Area, in a market such as that. So he was unemployed for a long while, and we know that the long-term unemployed have the hardest time finding work. So he took a position when he took that job that he earned significantly less money than he did as a property management executive. So he's just not certain if he's going to have enough money to keep things going. He also knows that he doesn't want to continue to be part of the homeless shelter cycle. He could just go from one shelter to another to another. But that's not what he wants to do because he knows that if he does that, someone who requires emergency services to come into that system, well, he's not that place and they can't come in. So where is he going to go? What is he going to do? He can't go back to Minnesota to stay with his family. He's pretty sure no landlord is going to rent to him because of his housing history. His friends aren't inviting him back to surface surf. And he, sure as anything, does not want to go back to sleeping under the sleeping bag in his car. What Matt really needs is affordable housing that he can continue to rebuild his life from. And that would be pretty fabulous. But he's not certain that he's going to be able to find that when the Bay Area has a housing occupancy rate of 98%. A lot of nonprofits are facing this challenge right now and are having some good luck, I have to say, with finding solutions and helping individuals like Matt. One of the greatest solutions is one that is fantastically simple. Our communities need and must have affordable, shared, at market housing with supportive services for individuals so that they can get back on their feet. These houses would be shared between a small group of formerly homeless individuals or families. And there are lots of families in this situation. The housing would be cooperative, but it's not subsidized housing. Instead, individuals are sharing the cost of their housing, the cost of their utilities, the resources that it requires to build a household. So they're keeping the cost down for themselves as well as for our community. Each individual can pay between $450 and $750 for one bedroom in a house. That's pretty good. But they're paying the landlord directly thereby rebuilding their credit, rebuilding their rental history, and quite frankly, rebuilding their confidence as they begin to gain control of their lives again. While they're there, they're building community with their housemates, and they're healing with dignity and respect from the injuries that happen being homeless. Each of the houses provides supportive services for individuals from different nonprofit groups, community-based organizations, and volunteer community mentors, ensuring that all of the members have an opportunity and the tools they need to maintain their housing, as well as keeping them moving on the direction, the forward direction. And nonprofit groups play a really key role in this. They screen, they place all the tenants in the house, so the landlords don't have to do that. They also do the upkeep on the property, so it's a great deal for landlords. It's a great deal. The goal of these houses is pretty fantastic. Are you ready for this? The goal is to create or change the identity of an individual from homeless, where they're sleeping on this, with a sleeping bag, to a resident, someone who has a place to live that's their own. And the success rates are amazing. 90% of all individuals move on to a home of their own, a permanent home of their own. 90%. Can't go wrong. Transforming the lives of the formerly homeless is a pretty dramatic thing to be a part of. And it's, of course, a worthwhile human value. But here's why it's also important in terms of economics. Who here has 
heard of the Million Dollar Marine? Anybody? So a handful of you, right? Um, then you know about Malcolm Gladwell's article, to, which really is assessing the cost of homelessness on the healthcare system. In his article, in his research, Gladwell determined that there was one man, Murray, and he had a quote that accumulated one million dollars in medical bills in the 10 years he lived on the streets of Reno. So contrast that to the cost of supporting someone in one of these cooperative homes. $613. $613 a year to provide affordable housing services to an individual in a cooperative house. It's clearly, it's cheaper, but it's also better for our communities. We have an opportunity to make things better for everywhere we're at, for our communities. I wanted to share with you a little bit more about Matt. Matt, today, he lives in one of these cooperative houses. I, I know this because I just saw him last week. <laughs> and he is doing, he's thriving, he's doing fantastic. He's had a chance to integrate back into his community. He feels like he can talk about things that have happened to him. He has thrown off the stigma associated with being homeless. He has a job. He has a home. He has great housemates. And he's a part of the community. He volunteers. He's really connected. It's pretty special. We tend to think about poverty as purely economic. But the reality is that there is an impoverishment of both community and relationships and knowledge. Addressing the whole person and all that comes with that makes our communities both stronger and healthier. And a healthy community is one that allows and encourages affordable housing integration within the community. The community I live is Petaluma, California. And it was, years ago, it was pretty rural and agricultural. But today, today it's very different. Today, technology, beer, and wine are outpacing the cows and the chickens. Today, it's suburban. And it looks a lot like any other American community. That's why Sonoma State economist Rob Eiler decided to study the economic impact of homelessness on our community. And what he found is that it only took 100 people to be on the streets, living on the streets of Petaluma. That's the number of people in the local homeless shelter. 100 people on the streets to have to cause a revenue loss of 1% for all local businesses. It's pretty significant. Healthy people, they're not blocking the doorways of these local businesses. They're not making our parks unsafe, and they're certainly not clogging our emergency resources in our systems. Healthy people are healthy employees. They're contributors to our community. They're doing good things. Housing is healthy. And it's more than just having a roof over your head. There's a tremendous economic and health and human value to providing affordable housing. We can decide something special tonight. Tonight, we can decide that homelessness is unacceptable, that it's not OK for someone like Matt or anyone else to spiral downhill and live in their cars. We have the power tonight to change our perceptions about what hopelessness is and the stigma that's associated with that. We can throw that stigma out the window. We have the power to ensure that there's affordable options for all of our previous community members. We, right here in this room, we have the power to make our community better, to make it healthier, and to make it stronger. Thank you.